right, I'm going to um, call the meeting of the Fairfield School Committee to order at 6.01 p.m. Welcome back, everyone. Happy fall. Everyone, school year milk to the good start. Thanks for your uh, first order of business is to review and approve the minutes of June 7th, 2022. And there wasn't an update the minutes that went out today. Hope everyone got it. Was missing a Oh, I'm sorry. I just, it didn't come on the day of. But it was scanned, the page two was not scanned. Oh. Any uh, comments? Hi. If we could just correct the um, subcommittee for to superintendency at, from regionalization subcommittee. Yes, that was an error on my part. Um, and because I was going to do the June 38 superintendency agreement. I don't know. Not regionalization. Thanks, Kevin. So I'd make a motion to approve the minutes if somebody hasn't already. As uh, uh, corrected. Yeah, I think that's what you're doing. Yeah. 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 Yeah
celebrate some of the things that we were able to do at the end of last school year with excess funds. So we had talked to the new meeting about um, allocating funds for the air conditioning as well as for the kitchen slash cafeteria. Uh, and the cafeteria is a huge one. We've talked about that a couple of years in a row now where there's been some deficiencies in equipment um, and even small things that the kitchen needed. So to spend $40,000 in that area with excess budget funds, which is for my was primarily salary driven because we did have some vacancies, um, we had at least one teacher position vacant plus other leave of absences and IA changes generating some extra funds. Um, so that was really exciting to be able to add some money there. Uh, and then there were also some purchases at the school level. Um, so educational supplies and materials were purchased, furniture, um, and I don't remember if that was classroom or office room we needed. I think we had an office here. We were going to do chairs in my office and we just moved things around. Um, there were some bookshelves and some classrooms. Yeah. Conference room. Oh, conference room. Conference room. Yep. Um, so we basketball hoops and soccer goals were we'll put in. Um, and then there was various small custodial equipment. And that's just to name a few of the things. The school did a really great job between um, Tina and the secretaries and the teachers, you know, sort of spending some of that quote unquote free cash at the end of the year. So that was really nice. Um, so I, I appreciate the school committee's support, especially in spending some funds on that kitchen equipment. So we did buy some equipment and pull up the list of some of it, some of this overlaps with the capital discussion. Um, so we bought some small equipment, uh, like bowls, um, serving utensils, lunch trays, those kind of things. But then we did some larger uh, purchasing. There should be, if it's not in yet, because some of this stuff does take time to get in, there is a new hot and cold food serving counter coming, which was really one of the big pushes. Um, our food service director said the one that we had was working fine, but um, really needed some significant improvement. So that's great there. I believe there is a new cashier counter and then a new silverware stand, which probably doesn't sound very exciting, but those things actually do add up. Like I think the silverware stand was like $850, which is shocking to me, but um, those make a big difference in what the staff can do and to create better efficiencies and then also just the experience of the student and staff going through the line. So those are some nice things to add on there. Any questions about any of that? Okay. Um, so after that, we still had a reclassification of demo funds of about $128,000. And when I say reclassification, that means that that money was still remaining in the budget at year end. We moved those funds into school choice for future use. So we can talk about use of those funds to support unforeseen expenditures that may come up this year, continue to make additional improvements on some of the things that kind of fall off the capital list, but really are still needs of the school, similar to what we do with end of year money. Um, so we can talk about that as the year goes on and how we want to use those. Uh, and then I did also give you a revolving fund update. So all of the revolving funds are in pretty good shape at this point. Uh, we were able to save up school lunch money uh, because we were paying salaries with ESSA funds. So all of our revenue coming in for free lunch is going to build up a significant balance there. School choice is, is pretty much standing about where we usually are. We are overextending in school choice, um, but that ends up typically year to year coming out in the wash. Uh, early childhood is one of the accounts that I want us to keep a close eye on because our revenue is down this year. And again, as the year progresses and we see enrollment changes, we can talk about this further. But our revenue is down, and the primary reason for that is uh, due to a decrease in five day special education students um, in the program. So typically, we have kids that come in for services here or there, or maybe they're two days a week or three days a week. There are uh, probably double what we had last year, at least for five day special education. So it's really great and important that we can uh, give them the services that they need. I'm certainly not discrediting that. I just want to make us aware that when that happens, it does result in a revenue loss. And when we are trying to fund the program with tuition, and when I say fund the program, we're paying at least a teacher and two IAs, I think, from that program um, currently. We're not making enough revenue to cover expenditures. 
And so something we're going to have to keep an eye on for the future. Um, one of the things for this year that sort of correlates with this early childhood conversation is that, you know, you know that the conversation came up really late in August, right? It was late last week of August that we were using a K classroom. So that frees up salaries in this year's general fund budget. Uh, we may want to talk about as the year progresses using some of those funds to help cover early childhood expenses since we're down revenue there. Or we may want to talk about using some of the uh, surplus from last year that we put in school choice to help cover early childhood expenses. So just some things coming up. I know I'm throwing a lot at you for the first meeting. Um, it's kind of nice to have something to talk about. I would say even doing so. I think our reports are so boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of other things on the uh, expense reports for the current year. So if you did take a really close look at them, you will see that a lot of the salary lines for teachers and the salary lines for IAs look completely out of whack. You see overages in one line and savings on others. That is because when the year starts, we never have everybody in the exact right spot. We're still moving parts. We're still trying to iron out the own details. Um, this week, I believe, is the second pay period. Is it the second? Very well. um, so hopefully after this week, it'll iron out because our there's not the same day. So I hope you're so the payroll office has an extensive list of me of where the math is for each person and what line they're supposed to be in. So hopefully next month that report looks a lot cleaner. And I will have an update for you on the exact salary is for savings. A couple of other lines, you'll notice legal fees are over. Uh, here is I expected that our attorney was going to change his legal costs. And put the bug in his ear prior to budget season, but it didn't work out that the contract was updated. So that's slightly over. It's not a ton of money, but it is a little bit of an overage. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to point out, and I'm pretty sure we talked about this last September also, is our maintenance line only has about 30% budget remaining for only being September 13th. That's kind of concerning for me. Uh, one of the large hits to this budget annually is about $7,500 for our energy management system, which is a contract with Siemens that we've had for many, many years. Uh, Deerfield's not the only school that has it. I think Sunderland also has it as well. And essentially, that company monitors our controls and systems in the building. If we didn't have that service, we're potentially um, spending more than that, either for energy loss or broken equipment. You know, they have a lot of monitors in the system. And they Thing us when things uh, don't look right. So while it is something we need, it does eat up a significant portion of our budget uh, right off the get-go. So I'd like to talk about how budget season adding some funds to offset that so that the maintenance and repairs line is truly dedicated to maintenance and repairs. Um, it could get bundled for, with testing so and inspection. Yeah. yeah, so we could move it out of maintenance. So true. It's not really maintenance. It's it's somewhat in line with like we get the sprinkler system inspected every year and those kind of things, so we can put it there. But either way, we're going to need to, or I'm going to recommend that we um, increase by the budget of the monitor contract. Uh, there have been some other things.
resources and stuff and know that it's a huge, it can be a big expenditure to like get to it, but there can be a lot of savings. Um, you know, for a lot of firms that are able to I mean have good not knowing really a, a lot about the ins and outs of what you're doing in this regard or what your interest is, but just you know, as a peer, all of the energy um, costs are going to continue to rise. So it's sort of like how do we look at it um, so that we're not camping all the time? Um, what are you is there a cost turning? So I think, and I'll just speak for myself, not for you, but I think that this is a larger conversation with towns and capital planning and transportation and buildings. Um, you know, I know there is conversation about you know, where do we put solar? How do we get more efficient? And these are conversations happening across all of the schools, all of the towns. Um, but there's nothing specifically on our list currently in that regard. Um, unless you have so where we know district wide, which is kind of coming in here, district wide, we have two buildings that look under water systems, but they're not under water systems. Um, it's very hard to do in the water systems based on the number of ETUs we have and um, getting off of natural gas as the main food sources are most of the flippers in our district. So, for greater district. Um, right now, we also are looking at the solar, whether or not your group can support solar. Um, early, Early rumors was that we can do it. So I understand that Bill does not want to build his own picture and get that information to the town is asking for that information. So, um, so again, that would be one of those questions whether or not we do it. So we're there, or I mean, it might be a town discussion because there's only so many spaces around the building, whether or not we should be taking spaces around the building for solar and then there's other parts of the town with rooms and So it might be a piece of the reason there. So it's balancing out a lot of our boilers are. Um, no deer goes off the top of my head, but if it's around everybody else's can you, you may know as well. But the boiler is around 30 years old. Yes, uh, it is. Is that about right? Yes. And so when you talk about if it's anywhere near the efficiency ratings of the boiler that we're doing, we just had an engineer with the ones at Frontier. They were meant to run around 80% efficiency, and now they're down to closer to over 70% efficiency, and they can't cycle, meaning they can't uh I'm using the wrong term here, but you can't kind of, kind of turn them on during this kind of a, a cool morning. It's either they're on or they're off. And so, um, and the newer ones can run at around like 97% efficiency. So even when we talk about replacing boilers, we are talking about reducing our fossil fuel and that kind of stuff. So deer fields coming in that, right now your boilers are running, they're okay, but you're right, we do need to do probably a five-year plan out because that, that, that thing is coming. Some, not all or five days a week, there's a big difference. 
Yeah. So we have that planned out. It's been part of the And that sort of is that sort of your business for? Just remember that, especially since there are many. So, right, so exactly. that's kind of so that's, that's, that's you know yeah. part of that discussion should be we should at least discuss it whether or not to be able to do this. If you're trying to wait for the room down because we don't have room because it's facing but it's a cost. Yeah. At least it should be discussed and understand the cost of what we say.
we're really looking at John Hattie, who is a researcher. He has meta-analysis of research. So we're really looking at what does the research say about instruction, about learning, and sort of implementing some of those. So um, we've got, our main goal is to support teachers to focus on learning and growth. And you can see up there the four criteria, um, all of which must be in concert with each other to, um, in order for us to be effective. So one is foster intrinsic motivation for teachers and students, engaging educators and students in continuous improvement of instruction and learning, inspire collective or teamwork, and affects all teachers and students. So for this year, last year we, after, after you know, a, a year and a little bit of COVID, we really wanted to get back to data meetings. And we had data meetings for a while and then with, with COVID um, and sort of changes of administration also, we weren't meeting typically for data meetings. So we started that back up again last year and we're really excited because this year we are expanding that. So it used to be grades three through six meeting for data meetings and now we are doing all, having all of the grades meet and we're also including specialists. So in terms of an um, instructional leadership team, we're really looking at growth of all teachers and all students. So we thought that that specialists, gym teachers, music teachers, art teachers, who might be librarians should be included in that to be focusing on, on data also. So it's really a school-wide initiative and it's not sort of like, okay, these teachers, it's really everyone. So yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about a data meeting. Data meetings are really an opportunity for us to compile data and, and we get many, many different sources of data. There are many different data points. So just in terms of, um, for example, um, uh, in terms of um, language arts, you might have fluency tests, you've got comprehension tests, you've got, you know, writing to look at, you've got many, many, and depending on the grade, those, those, the data that we were, we're looking at vary. So what you're looking at in kindergarten is quite different for sixth grade, for example. So we compile all that data. We are um, giving it to teachers. Teachers are also collecting it, so it's not the ILT saying, here's your data, it's, it's a collection. We're putting it together to create an image, to create a picture for teachers to look at so that they can really make plans. And then based on that data, it might be MCAS and, and what's called NEVA, which is a standardized test. Um, they're looking at all of that data, and from there, we're looking at what are some goals that we want to set. So last year, we would set a goal, and then the point of data meetings is to set a goal and then set some plans, some instructional practices around those goals, and then come back again, and we meet three times a year, and revisit and take a look at the, the outcomes, and have we met those goals? If not, it's almost like, it's really great. It's kind of like this um, group of teachers working together, a group of, of other um, specialists looking at the, the interventions and thinking about how those interventions and what our instruction is doing in terms of increasing the outcomes. We really hope to shift our resources too. So if we see students whose learning is stalled, we may shift our interventionists into that classroom or into an RTI approach so that we're trying to catch all students um, and we can make sure that there's growth that the student can have. Also, we will look at, we'll dig deeper if we're seeing a student that's stalled and struggling, we'll look at absenteeism and that's a factor. We have a DESA screener, which is our social and emotional screener too, to see if that's factoring in. So it just gives us a little bit of a snapshot and then we look at those students and we keep them. Does that answer your, your question? And you can see actually up there, it's it's a little bit hard to read, but you can see those are, what you see along that top line there are just data points. So there are there are many that we're looking at because you can't really look at uh, any one student with one or even two um, data points. So while MCAS might be instructional, you want to put that in, in context of all the other points. Um, so that's, that's really um, one of our big goals this year. Yeah, 
So we have four initiatives this year. And one is responsive classroom that Chris is going to talk a little bit about, success criteria that I'm going to talk uh, about, walkthroughs, and some new curriculum. So I'll just start with what we call success criteria. And success criteria, if you think about, um, let's see, if you think about hitting a target and you can't, can't see that target and it's, it's really difficult to see the target, Basically, you really can't um, address it. You can't, you can't do what it takes to address that target. So it's sort of like if you think about if someone tells you to prepare a healthy dinner, what would you, what would you need? And even though you know what the intention is, if you don't have a clear description of what that healthy dinner is, then it's hard to, to navigate that. So now imagine a classroom of 24th graders and a teacher who asks them to construct a brain catchment system for science. If the students don't know, well, what, what does that mean in terms of being successful? What does that look like? It's, it's similar to a diet. You need to know exactly what does a healthy diet look like. You need to know what do, what do I need to be successful when I'm creating a brain catchment system or um, in order to solve these math problems or in order to write a narrative, um, a, a piece of strong narrative writing. So success criteria is just making the learning very visible to students. And so that is a huge initiative of us this year where we are working towards creating success criteria. And we're gonna be starting creating success criteria with responsive classroom that this is gonna talk a little bit about. And then eventually moving that towards success criteria in terms of academic subjects. Um, and ideally having students create that success criteria with their with their teachers, which is a really powerful way because then they take ownership of it. Yes. We're going to move on to responsive classroom. It was something that we started in the spring. We had a big kickoff for the district. And this year, we're really focusing on the idea of around morning meeting. And morning meeting is a chance that, to begin the morning with your classroom and build that community with teacher. It's a great way to get to know each other and really build that trust and that freedom of putting risks as learners together. Um, we'll talk, um, back up just for a second, right, back to responsive classroom. So we are going to do morning meeting, and we're going to work into the idea of full school routine. So as a school, we're going to come up with a list of criteria that will be meeting to address the routines together. So it'll all look uniform throughout the school, and we'll all have a common understanding of what ourselves and our bodies and our and our buddies' systems will look like throughout the entire school. It'll be agreed upon throughout. The next part that we're going to be talking about are walkthroughs. This is something newer to us, but is a long-standing tradition in education. We are going to be thinking about as a team walking through the classrooms and looking for visible signs of our initiatives in place. So one of the things we're going to immediately be looking for are morning routines and morning meetings, and we're going to be looking for the success criteria. We might be talking to students, the school teacher talk. Uh, it's a great way to look for patterns throughout the school. And then we'll come back as a team and talk about the information that we've seen and see what drives our next steps for the ILT development of that. And then the final part is new curriculum. So the exciting part. And so we have a lot of new, we have some new district assessments that we've been putting a lot of effort and energies into, which is the DIMPLES. And that's our state mandate for the dyslexia mandate screener. So we've been working on that. Um, quickly right off the bat. And we're also implementing some new core curriculum, like with those steps. We have some upper grade teachers that are looking at implementing and piloting two or one or two modules of this newer system, just to get a feel of what a comprehensive reading program looks like. And we've been able to spend some time planning and discussing some of these lessons beforehand so that they can go ahead and implement them within the classroom and then come back and kind of complete. It feels like a very supportive um, idea of implementing this very rigorous and comprehensive program. Um, being a writer is a new work writing program that we're going to be looking at. Teachers have the ability to choose a writing unit throughout the year that they need to implement. And oh, the number sense screener is one of our newer math uh, screening uh, initiatives that we'll be looking at. The ILC is just trying to get into the classrooms and with the teachers before, during, and after, just to try to wrap around support for them. Thanks. Thanks. I won't be coming down yet. Updating you on our progress and 
cannot simply assume that this work will get integrated and embedded into our systems without having actionable and measurable goals. You can only make actionable and measurable goals if you know what action needs to be taken and how we will measure to see if those actions have been achieved. Uh, so that to have that knowledge requires some working learning. So I hope this opportunity to grow your role as our city leaders. Please email me if you're interested, jennifer.smith at frsu38.org, and I can send you the one hour onboarding. You can give us feedback. Do you need yourself to be on? Thanks. Was there anyone else in the room? First, so that we can talk about what we give to staff so that it's um, synced up or intentionally not synced up. <laughs> sure. oh, so, Laura did a, a conversation there with that. Laura did a, a retreat for all of us. Based on Jennifer's work. Uh, based on Jennifer's few, work. So, I'm just making sure. Yeah, yeah just making sure we're. What they're doing now and not going this year. Either way. It still would be valuable to look at. It sounds like what you're offering is something different or, or not a bridge, but a different thing. So there's something that, as a new committee member, um, that it may not have had access to because it was something we had been on. Yeah, the longer pathways yes. that we've talked about over the years, she wasn't on the school right. committee when those were kind of put out there and people need study groups and that kind of thing. Yeah, so, so yes, it's not so more of a bridge, um, but the link to those is, is embedded. Okay. So you certainly can continue your own learning through that. Right. Yeah. Probably much more extended.
And then there's different prices depending on whether or not somebody qualifies for free, reduced, or a cash paying student. So the state's portion is going to offset whatever federally the USDA does not cover. So we ultimately, in the end, should end up getting, in some way, shape, or form, around four forty-five per student for lunch. Um, I think breakfast is like two sixty per student. Um, so we should be bringing in good revenue from this this year, which is great news because we are paying staff again back from the school on the volume account. Um, so we are going to need funds, and we still are in need of, of more equipment. Um, I also think it's a good opportunity for us to build up this fund. It's not normal to hold as much money as we have currently in one state or two thousand dollars in the revolving fund for school lunch currently. That's not typical. Usually, you're breaking even or you're losing money in the school lunch program. Um, I, I'm nervous about what happens if this goes reverse on us in another year because we have, we'll have no idea what kids are going to pay for lunch if this goes back to being cash pay for a significant portion of our population. Um, so I think it's wise of us to hold on to what we can as reserves so that in the future we're prepared for that shift and transition. Um, it's really important, and if the school can help us stress this, I know Tina has sent out information already, the state's calculation is based on free and reduced lunch eligibility. They really want schools pushing those applications to families as if a family really needed to submit the free and reduced. Um, that's sort of fallen off the priority list over the last couple of years, especially last year, the numbers were not based at all on the actual counts of free, reduced, or paid. They are going to be based on that for the current year. Yeah, it's concerning more in our district as well, where our poverty is not as, um, it looks different than in urban poverty. A lot of people are very proud people and, and will not submit forms. They don't need to submit forms. You know, so it's hard, I think it's, I think I'm upset with the state because it's a hard thing to sell. We are a fill this four page form. They don't need to get free money. The school needs to get, you know, it's a hard, you know, they don't get anything out of it besides, you know, some um, uncomfortableness of having to do it. Sharing that, so I hope they can help us do better soon. It's, it's kind of like, here's the old system, but we're going to put a new system with no incentive to help us out. And we had problems with people filling out even prior. There were people who qualified for free as much as did fill out the paperwork, um, just because of the type of script we have in our community. Now. Learn as and learn. I still realize they would qualify too. Looks scary because. 
because it's two pages and the print is like this big. And, and that's set by the state. You know, they give us a template. There was a letter at the top of the application that came from central office um, that explained that school lunch was free for everyone this year, where to return the form, and also some of the other benefits. So families that do qualify for free and, and reduced lunch may be eligible for SNAP benefits or pandemic PBT, you know, that was something that they put in place last year. I haven't heard that they're continuing that, but it gives families that need it, you know, those extra benefits as well. Um, so you do have to provide some income information. There are guidelines from the state. It's basic as far as your own information that you're providing. That comes into central office. The state says that we have to have someone that opens and reviews applications, and then there's someone who makes the final approval. And then there's an appeal process as well. So you really wouldn't hear from us again unless we wanted more information about your qualifications. Um, and then a letter automatically goes out one way or another. Sorry, I'm smiling, but you can't see. Yeah, or another. I'm just nodding that smile on the. I get that. Yes, yeah, so um, like all time that I scheduled both viewers and frontiers meeting on October 4th on October 4th. So I'm going to move that to a non religious call. Probably should go ahead and just suggest. We could suggest pushing it from today. Or we can also move the phone to the left and just come to the other end of the room Tuesday night when we find it. Which sounds like a long email. Maybe easier just moving it above it. Know the holiday, so a holiday starts the night before, and it doesn't really end until after sundown of the, the following day. So having it on so that the eleventh is better off. Sure. Um, we do the eleventh. Shot a in my car and moved it. I was like, oh my god. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have substitute uh, pay increase, which we will take a vote on. Thank you. You can share. Um, I'd like to, um, last year our sub pay was $93 a day. I'd like to move it up to $100 a day. Um, again, you know, I have a list of substitute salaries from districts around us, and this would put us kind of in the, the upper upper mid of that. Um, there are three field days, 95 with a high school diploma, 100 with a degree, and 105 if you're certified. Half of the price of one less, 85, half of the price 90, Mohawk is 95, Mohawk, whether by the hour, and I guess that New York Hampton does 120, Belgian John does 100, Gateway does 100. So those are ones I have. So it kind of puts us in there. It's hard to get subs as it is, it's a hard job. I think we need to continue to look at increasing it. So I don't think it has any impact on the budget. Has an impact on the budget, but that's something I should be concerned about about taking the budget. So, looking for a bill to do it till $100 per day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't hear the motion in second, so I don't know who did it. I'm trying to take notes. <laughs> Nancy, 
Gary made a motion and then Eric was the second. Oh, sorry, Stan is second. Just cornered. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just asked a, a question about when we were supposed to vote. So, uh, any further discussion before we vote? Okay, hearing none. Um, not to do a <laughs> yes. Yes. Roll call. You can do. Okay. You can do I. Okay. Uh, for those of us in the room, the pain increase. Or ten. Yes. session for this if you want to discuss it because this could start collective bargaining. I'm not recommending that you do that. I think you're gonna probably have this discussion a little bit, but that'll be up to you. Um, I'll explain it and then you guys can decide what we want to do. Um, so our UNC members um, as part of our negotiations we are dropping the bottom we're dropping um, the bottom two steps and moving and the plan was to move everybody on to step three. Now, when we started doing hiring and that kind of thing, we realized that we're having people who worked here last year, they are on the same, we look at their, recognize their year of experience, and they're still, they're on the first same step as the first, someone with no experience. This doesn't affect a lot of people, but I think in honoring what a step means, this is not something that we discussed in negotiations. If it was discussed in negotiations, it wasn't here without here. Um, yeah, you know, we'd like to see um, those IAs who were hired last year from step one move up to step four. Um, again, these are the most paid people in the district. Um, and, you know, I think recognizing the career service, and I think the number of people we're actually talking about district wide is half a dozen. Well, a dozen? Maybe, ten. maybe ten. So I think the most is in the area of like six. Um, so, that's kind of the financial impact. It's not going to be huge, but I think it does. You know, it's very hard to get an IAX right now. I think it's the right move because they recognize those who were with us last year. So, if you need to go to executive session, we can put that conversation on pause, go through the rest of the agenda, and we have to come back and vote on it. So, but it's up to you. Quick point. You could do is you could do a motion to, to go for it, and if everybody agrees to it, then you don't have to go to executive session to discuss it. Or if someone says they wish to have a conversation, have an interesting conversation about that. I'd make a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding. That's presented. Are we have Mary with a second. And yes. All and cut it back, yes. Uh, next is reports. Uh, the chair has no reports. Um, collaborative. Any have you had a chance to meet again? I don't. Let's meet again. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, is there a person report? So I emailed you the superintendent report. Um, I think, sorry, I might go through. Here, I'm just kind of um, Basically, I, I guess, give you know, we've kind of touched upon or you've seen before, but, you know, uh, COVID, kind of the, the update within our superintendent's report. Um, you know, it's still, it's still with us in the sense that we're seeing students with it. Um, I think that the numbers that I had uh, last Friday, there's we don't have very accurate reporting. Um, we had Deerfield had five positive cases last week from the start of the school year last Friday. Um, and so it is kind of going through. We're seeing it also at Frontier. Frontier had 16 COVID cases. Um, a lot of those actually happened even before school started with athletes. Um, but uh, we 
we did provide tests on the first day of school to go home. We're going to do another work for the time here that was getting some more tests on the state, but distributing those so that people can test their own have the ability to do so. That's kind of where we're at. I don't know if you have questions on it. There's it's kind of the new model model the mode is to is mitigation. So you know we do have outbreaks uh, in some classrooms. There's this little kind of families mask wearing. I haven't got a whole lot of feedback negatively in the direction we're going. I think there's um, kind of a understanding where we're kind of at at this point. So there's also like the flu going through. So I mean, you're all living it. You know, it's like you have a cough and it's like the flu is it not? You know, that kind of stuff. Kids. Yeah, and it's had those back stuff that are happening again or what's that? We, what's that? We, we just had a back bus. Um, oh, we said back bus. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. 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 it was like the 29th, a yeah. couple days yeah. before school started. Yeah. Uh, right. But the problem yeah. is the yeah. new vaccine yeah. just came out. Right. And that's you know the more prominent prominent variants that we're seeing uh, now. And those vaccines I was looking last week had not reached CBS, as you were know, talking about, the end of last week into this week, we're not getting here. I'm not sure if doctor's offices are getting They're here. They are. They are already here. Okay, so. Yeah, I know someone who had it yesterday. Yeah. So, I don't know, you know, I can talk with the Dr. Carolyn Hess yesterday, this morning. Um, you know, I can find out the next time and when I've done the vegetables again. I think they're going to probably wait to the 60, if we 60 days between boosters, so I've got some of the other things to that. Which was kind of timing wise. You got that booster at the end of the month, you don't get people get qualified for the other booster back. Do you think you're planning other vaccines because that was like something about the potential for like um our our nurse new nurse leader, um Kara, will be sending out one of the things we are gonna do, we can talk about communication at some of the other school community meetings, is that the nurse leader um, is now going to be doing we're trying to figure out the timing of how often, but it's going to be sending newsletters out, help not just COVID based, but all kind of all things that um, the family needs to know. And she's, I think she's hoping to send it out on Thursday. So she's done. She's been the first week in Deerfield um, helping with coverage. So that's been right on board to the nurse over there. So there'll be more information coming out that way. Hope to regular communication about what's going on through uh, the newsletter directly from the nurse rather than. It's kind of like if it was funneling through me last year, and I think it's better to have kind of a different people that you can think about. Um, so, yeah. 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 All right, so um, any other questions? Um, I am in the process of early childhood coordinator. Uh, Amy Sensioli has resigned, uh, has, has resigned to take on a position with Jesse. Um, and so that kind of sudden at the end of August. So right now in the new process for a new coordinator, I'm going to have an update on that very soon. Facility updates we already done. The Tri Revision and Frontier is going to affect you guys directly. And you guys probably have already been introduced to Jennifer Shumway. Um, she's doing a wonderful job taking over for Donna. So please reach out to her if you have anything. There was an error we, we sent out. She sent out a guide uh, that had some documents that we actually need to delete the first file of uh, this packet. And the packet was sent out today. It just had an additional information that we need to be part of the library. And then I have ongoing projects that you guys can read through. And there's some links in there as well, um, especially looking through PD or the weekly plans. Um, at the next meeting, we will have October meetings when, you know, um, Laura will be here talking about MGAS. We'll also be talking about, um, we're talking about whether that will have school then or remember, we just did a good chunk of what how useful we have. Um, and so That's we have a lot more. Um, Sure. Oh, you missed it. Why is that? Because I see that that's part of your ongoing 
Yeah. You know, I should I should have touched upon that. So I have a meeting today tomorrow with my leadership team. Uh, if we will be setting up the the uh, either risk of equity committees meeting dates for that, um, and also setting up the agendas and stuff. So, so they're still they're on so for the year. I contract them for um, we contract to them for next year. Um, they're also doing a um, leadership for a council member for me and the leadership team, as well as overseeing the uh, uh, the effort. So we're kind of tomorrow we're going to kind of go through and set the agenda for the first meeting, set all the meeting dates, so everybody can expect to have the email officially thereafter, announcing those dates and putting new people and bringing new people on board. So yes, that's kind of thank you for mentioning that. Not, since that's going to be on our agenda, I would um, take a motion to the second. Oh, Eric, I'll take a motion. 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 Eric, I'll take a